134th day of class, Pearl Harbor in the Pacific Theater. And you've already been taught about both of these items, but today I want to put a couple different perspectives and scales on this and give you a personal perspective. And we started off class with the question, what do you already know about these two things? And I said, no Google, no books. I wanted this from straight memory. And if I compiled all of the answers from all of the classes, essentially this is what I got. People said Pearl Harbor. It was a sneak attack. They got the date probably because it's hanging on my wall. December 7th, 1941, as FDR said, a date that will live in infamy. Uh, got America into the Second World War. A lot of people talked about the Pearl Harbor movie. Josh Hartnett is a dream sickle, I don't blame you. Hawaii, you know, that's where it happened. And Japan was the aggressor. It was Japan's fault. They sucker punched us for no good reason. And that was the gist of what people said. And then the Pacific Theater, island hopping. No, Pacific is enormous and had to go from island to island to island. Very, very difficult. People, actually, if they didn't know the name of it, they said, you know, that one where they raised the flag on that island. That's Iwo Jima, by the way. Uh, brutal fighting. Just absolutely awful brutal fighting. Japan would never surrender. They would fight to the last man. People tapped into this uh, Japanese ethos of uh, Bushido code, you know, not going to quit over anything. People were talking about that. Kamikaze pilots. Everybody remembered the kamikaze pilots. Divine wind and that these people would take their planes and flying them into the ships and that kind of thing. And then Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the end of the war. But that's not all there is to it. This notion that America you know, the victim in Japan, this bully, this aggressor, might not be the case. I want to share with you a couple perspectives to get this across. But before we got into the history, I gave you a personal perspective. And there's, there's a notion that some historians say that all history is local. And I think what that means is that you learn items in, in a book and you learn about what happened, but there's a human perspective. It, these things affected people. And today we're talking about a historical event, the uh, Pacific Theater. And 16 Americans served in World War II. That's 11% of the total population. But this is my grandfather. This is my mother's father, wonderful man. And he served in the Pacific Theater. And thank goodness the photographer was able, and this official American uh, a photographer, you can see the eagle and the boat. This is a wartime photo, but I'm really happy that they dated it, July of 1942. And there is my grandfather in Asia. And, you know, just a few months before, he was living in America, uh, you know, typical Midwestern guy. And then all of a sudden, like 16 million others of his brothers and sisters, they were shipped off to either Europe or the Pacific. In his case, it was the Pacific. And this was his hat. He was a captain. And this was his officer's hat. And um, it's a very precious artifact to me. I wouldn't give it up for anything. There's no price tag you can put on it, the sentimental value. And I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of his service. And I told the class, if you run into a veteran, thank them. Shake their hands. Say, welcome home. Because the sacrifice the veterans have gone through is tremendous. And we don't have this country without them. And, you know, my grandfather's one of many. So it's personal perspective. In addition to this, you know, historical perspective, for the most part, people were mimicking what they heard in eighth and ninth grade. Here's a personal perspective. But let's go a little deeper. The side, the, the Japanese perspective and the American one. And this photo is our starting point. This shows Pearl Harbor at its scariest. Big plumes of black smoke billowing into the sky enormous ships sinking to the ocean, people scrambling to try to save as many people and feeling like sitting ducks, this attack, and you're on an island and this desperation. That's the starting point. But here's a question. Why would Japan do that? Why would Japan awake the sleeping giant in the United States? And the general historical perspectives, if you ask people, the United States it was an act of treachery, part of a deep-seated conspiracy against peace. How dare they? In Japan, it's an oopsie. Well, it was a tactical blunder. You know what? We probably didn't play our cards right. Let's move on. So very different perspectives. Even the books. Now, these uh, very um, popular and well-known and, and, and often read books, I would argue, is very simplistic. I read this when I was taking my prerequisites at Michigan State University. Studs Turkel, The Good War. 
you know, the greatest generation. We, you know, that, bah, 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 bah. you know, America good, America good, Japan bad, Japan bad. Japan 1941 by uh, Iri Hota kind of the different in a different different vibe saying well you know let's take it from the japanese perspective i'm going to argue this is simplistic nobody's all good or all bad or all responsible or not all responsible not in history certainly not in history so we're going to go from three different scales a close-up view about the point where it, the uh history happened in 1941 then we're going to take a few years back take a mid-range view and what caused Pearl Harbor from a little bit of a medium distance? And then we're going to go back many years prior to shed some light on Pearl Harbor and why it happened. So let's start off with a close-up scale. In March to November of 1941, the Americans and the Japanese were talking. But if you look at this map, the red is Japan and the blue is America. Are we getting really close to stepping on each other's toes? But I want to show you a picture, two pictures, excuse me, about body language. And look at these meetings that were going on during these months in 1941. Looking pretty, pretty com comfortable. Here's our American looking fairly pensive, very tense. And look at this guy feeling good, feeling confident. And then the meeting. Hey, woohoo, feeling good. All right. And look at the American contingency. This is not a look of welcome. This is not a look of uh, let's break bread this is a look of real concern and real concern so uh japan was doing very well they were going through their military battles like a knife through soft butter i mean they're feeling maybe too confident and america's feeling too untrusting so at this point japan's feeling good america's feeling very nervous and you have to ask yourself were these differences um resolvable or not i don't know you know i think a good quote from the outset the americans were unresponsive to japanese overtures as the japanese were uncomprehending of american goals and maybe that's where it is too so you know america this moral idealism and unified by the threat of nations in world war ii and this uh four principles that hull wrote and talk about in a second um you know righteous indignation of what the japanese are doing in china and japan was saying hey you know what um we'll kind of do it our own way were these differences unsolvable i don't know it's, it's a question but obviously it wasn't resolved with talking it was resolved with military and i'm going to convert these from egghead into plain english now the hull memo was the official policy on how the united states was going to handle asia one respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of each and all nations hey other countries you can do your own thing number two support of the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries Hey, other countries, that's your government, not ours. You do your thing. Number three, support of the principle of equality, including equality of commercial opportunity. Hey, we all can make a buck. And then number four, non-disturbance of the status quo in the Pacific, except as the status quo may be altered by peaceful means. Hey, we're not going to topple the apple cart. We're going to keep things as is, um, and we're going to keep the status quo by peace. Now, this is what America said, but let's look at the evidence. Let's go to a mid-range view from 37 to 41. Now, Japan was expanding its war in China, and America said, hey, cut it out. But if you look at these, hey, leave us alone. You said you're going to leave us alone, but you're doing this. And then the sanctions against oil. And you can see, you know, Japan is an, uh, a nation the size of California, four big islands. They needed that oil. And America cut them off. And, hey, I thought we had commercial opportunity and equality here, pal. And then Japan's vulnerability as an island nation you know, that's a position where that's going to make them a little edgy. So was Pearl Harbor just some sucker punch at random? If you look at these mid-range views, did the Japanese have some legitimate gripes against America? Maybe, maybe not. And bear in mind, if you look at Japan, they are surrounded by the British, the French, the Russians, and the Germans to the west, and the Americans to the east. That situation, that geography, this point in the world, are they going to be a little on edge? I think it's safe to say, yeah. And can you blame them? And this cartoon, this political cartoon. Now, here is Japan looking like Halloween or something. They were bullying China, crying, kneeling, slapping them around. Here's America saying, cut it out. You can't do that. But going back to the whole memo, Japan, if they look this, the word of the law or the word of the memo and say, hey, this is what you say? That's not what you're doing. You can make a legitimate case that the United States was acting in a hypocritical manner that may have angered them. 
And again, they kept on going. They kept on going saying, you know, we're going to keep on doing our thing in China and we don't give a hoot what you say. Makes America mad, uh, makes Japan feeling a little too, you know, uh, big for their britches. And we're seeing this tension increasing. And then if you go back even further, you go back close to a century, the quote unquote opening of Japan. So when America extended the Pacific, when Commodore Perry showed up, this sparked a complete change in Japanese culture. This ushered in Japan having this uh, Meiji restoration where they had to westernize and be on par with every other country, never be picked on again. Unequal treaties, Japan vowed to never let this happen again, and Japan changed their way. You know, I think these paintings are great, the way they see Commander or Commodore Perry's arrival. Here's the American version, oh, and here's the Japanese version. Obviously, two different perspectives here. And Japan went to the West, and modeled themselves like the West, and they were successful. Nobody was going to mess with them again. They were on par, and after the Meiji Restoration, they had 80 years of success and growth and industrialism and military uh, feats. It was going pretty well for Japan. The mission accomplished, if you will, but America showing up 90 years earlier, that changed everything. Maybe that was still in the back of the Japanese mind. And then you have industrialism and imperialism, as I mentioned. And Japan wants to hang with the big dogs in these areas, too. So does America. So were we on a crash course to Pearl Harbor? Probably. And whether you look at it short-term, mid-range, or long-term. But I am going to um, present to you a question. Was Pearl Harbor a complete sucker punch, a complete surprise? Now, this is 1890, 50 years before Pearl Harbor. The prime minister told the world, you know, people knew. He said, if we wish to maintain the nation's independence among the powers of the world, it is not enough to guard against the line of sovereignty. We must also defend the line of advantage. He's calling it out 50 years beforehand. Time Magazine, November 5th, 1941. The leader of Japan, in a very well-read, uh, high circulation rate magazine, Put this in Time Magazine where it read, how can we let the United States continue to do as it pleases, even though there is some uneasiness? Two years from now, we will have no petroleum for military use. Ships will stop moving. When I think about the strengthening of the American defenses in southwestern Pacific, the expansion of the U.S. fleet, the unfinished China incident, and so on, I see no end of the difficulties. We can talk about suffering and austerity, but can our people endure such a life for long? I fear that we would become a third class nation after a year or after two or three years if we merely sat tight. He's calling it out. He's calling it out. So was it a total surprise? Maybe, maybe not. I wasn't there, but based on this evidence, it probably wasn't a total surprise. And let's add this into the mix. You know, if you are of Japanese, the American perspective on Asians, look at this one. The Asian guy with a gun and a knife in his teeth and a torch killing. This tiger represents Asia ripping the world apart, excluding the Chinese, American manhood versus Asiatic coolism. And here's President Coolidge in 1924 signing paperwork to keep Asians out of America. So, you know, if you get wind of that, how you're treated, you know, it's going to add adds to the whole puzzle of why this thing happened. And we wrapped up class with these two questions. Explain why Pearl Harbor happened on three different scales, that close-up. Maybe it was Japanese overconfidence. Um, and the mid-range scale, the Hull memo, the oil getting cut off, that's going to really affect them. You mess with somebody's money, you mess with their emotions. And then if you go to a deeper scale, perhaps some resentment way back when, when Perry showed up in the 1850s and changed Japan forever. Now to attempt to lose the historical bias and this is hard because there's real strong biases how we've been raised how would you describe pearl harbor in a manner both american and japanese students would agree with and at this point you'd need to rely on facts you'd need to rely on primary sources and you'd have to be even keeled use hedging language perhaps you could say there was past history of conflict that spilled over into a military uh, war something to that effect dates December 7th, 1941, factual dates, uh, saying how long it lasted. But again, it's very difficult to do this. So there's some pretty heavy-duty du history today in terms of scale and perspective and all these sorts of things. But hopefully it gave you a fresh look on how to look at Pearl Harbor and remind you of what you learned about in the Pacific Theater of World War II. Thanks for watching.